When you mention United States Army to the average citizen, he usually thinks of troops being trained for combat. To a certain extent, this is true. The Army's primary mission is to organize, train, and equip Army forces for prompt and sustained combat anywhere in the world, as directed by our nation's civil leaders. However, the Army has yet another vital mission to perform. A non-combat civil assistance mission, of which the average citizen is not usually aware. This film is about that special assistance mission, the Army's other role. Throughout our nation's history, the Army, as an instrument of United States policy, has been called upon to fight in numerous wars. During and between those conflicts, it has continued to render our country, as well as other friendly countries, priceless services in such fields as public health, construction, waterway development, technology, agriculture, disaster relief, exploration, and domestic action projects. Unfortunately, the time limit of this film permits the presentation of only a very few examples. One of the most significant of the non-combat activities undertaken by the early U.S. Army was the Lewis and Clark Expedition. At the direction of President Thomas Jefferson, Captain Meriwether Lewis and Lieutenant William Clark, together with a party which included 29 Army personnel, set out to explore the Louisiana Purchase in May 1804. To reach their destination, the mouth of the Columbia River, the men traveled some 4,000 miles by boat, horseback, on foot, and in canoes. The importance to our nation of the fund of information obtained on the geography, topography, climate, fauna and flora resources and inhabitants of the great Northwest can never be overestimated. For the next half century, the Army was the only organization able to encourage and assist our pioneer ancestors in their development and westward expansion. It conducted nearly all the exploration. It constructed roads and trails leading west, built bridges and canals, and prepared the maps which were so necessary in the opening of new lands. As the citizens moved west, they not only moved over army roads and trails with the aid of army maps, but their goods and lives were protected by army troops. When the importance of the West increased, San Francisco grew into a considerable city. With its growth, there was a growth of commerce. The Army developed the railroads and protected the trains. Then later, when the need for waterborne commerce became urgent, the Army played a momentous role in the construction of the Panama Canal. Building of the canal began in 1904. The French had tried it previously, but were forced to abandon the project because of, among other problems, the high fever. However, thanks to Major Walter Reed, an army surgeon, and a team of army physicians and enlisted men who gambled their lives by submitting themselves to yellow fever infection, the answer was found to the dread disease. The experiments were heroic. The results, historic. Had it not been for Major Reed's discovery, a frightful death toll might have prevented the accomplishment of the undertaking. The canal was completed in 1914 
and was opened by presidential proclamation on July 12, 1915. It was a remarkable achievement of engineering and a lasting monument to the ability and efficiency of the United States Army in the accomplishment of a peacetime mission. But the construction of the canal was only one of a continuing series of projects conducted by the Army for the development of our country's waterways. Its main thrust is in the United States, where some of its accomplishments include the construction and operation of 28,600 miles of waterways, comprising the most extensive navigation in the world. As well as the construction and maintenance of almost 300 coastal harbors, through which hundreds of millions of tons of freight are shipped each year. Among its many services to the nation, the Army has a statutory responsibility of providing relief in the event of disaster. For instance, on March 24, 1964, Alaska was hit by one of the most violent earthquakes ever recorded. Thousands were injured. Many were dead. The damage was estimated at more than $450 million. Within minutes after the disaster, every military installation in the Alaskan Command went into action. The active Army, Army National Guard, and Army Reserves rushed troops from the Medical Corps, Military Police, Corps of Engineers, and Signal Corps to the stricken areas. An emergency communications center was quickly established. The sick and injured were taken to military and civilian hospitals. The homeless were sheltered, many at the Army's Fort Richardson and Elmendorf Air Force Base. In the meantime, the Army, together with the other services, continued its round-the-clock job. Throughout the night, troops and civilian volunteers searched tirelessly for the dead and injured. Private property was placed under military protection. Water and sanitation facilities were repaired. Army water tanks from Fort Richardson were set up in areas where the need was greatest. And Army field kitchens operated on a 24-hour schedule. From Civil Defense Headquarters, calls for help were relayed through MARS, the military affiliate radio system the only means of communication to the outside world. Medicine, food, water, clothing, and hundreds of other items were requested, including a complete army hospital. The supplies, mostly from military stock, were flown in by the Air Force. Time was short. Alaska had to be put back on its feet before winter set in. There was much to be done. Top priority was the repair of the Alaska Railroad, a vital link in the transportation network. Harbors were dredged. Docks were repaired. And highways were rebuilt. By the end of the fall, Alaska was getting back on its feet. Fishing and canning industry was in operation again. The trains were rolling. The children were in school. And the people were looking forward with confidence to a greater prosperity than ever before. Just as the army prepares men for military service, 
so does it prepare them for a non-military re-entry into civilian life. Through a program called Project Transition, maximum guidance and training or educational opportunities are provided the serviceman during the last six months of his duty. The purpose of the program is to give the returning soldier a marketable skill which will enhance his chances of good employment. For example, Men requiring further education are placed in programs which will upgrade their educational status. Men with skills developed through army training and which are civilian related receive refresher courses in such fields as automotive maintenance, data processing, welding, machine shop, postal work, and radio and television repair. The major thrust in the training area is to involve American industry to the maximum in providing skilled training in jobs for which there is a specific requirement. When the serviceman receives such training and a placement opportunity prior to separation from the service, he is in a better position to make a social and economic re-entry into civilian life. Through its extensive resources and human skills, the Army, including the National Guard and Reserves, is attempting to overcome some of the serious domestic problems which face our nation today. It has shown an awareness of its responsibility to the community by supporting the President's Youth Opportunities Program and by conducting domestic action programs for less fortunate children all over the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii. One example is a program conducted at Fort Tilden, New York, located within a stone's throw of the Atlantic Ocean. Here, the Army has provided equipment and facilities for Camp Kiwi, a project sponsored by the New York Association for Brain Injured Children. Brain injured children are not to be confused with mentally retarded children. Brain damage can occur at any time. It can happen at birth, from a childhood disease, a bad fall, being struck on the head, or from various other causes. Each morning, within sound of pounding surf, the camp director discusses the problems and progress of the children with his counselors. Uh, Jeff, I'm moving Stephen to your group this morning. He's 13, I think he can work out well with the older boys. Okay. Uh, Paula, your group is really beautiful. Uh, your exercises are wonderful. Thank you. Oh, by the way, yesterday Sandra fell and scraped her knee. I put a Band-Aid on it, but what do we do in case of a serious accident? Well, in case of any emergency, notify John or myself immediately. Uh, Major, can we count on you for your help? Yes, I have a doctor and an ambulance at your disposal at any time. If you have a real emergency, I can have a helicopter here within minutes. Fine. Thank you, Major. It's good to know we have the Army behind us. Uh, this morning we're going to because all the children are handicapped, they are formed into small groups with two counselors and one aide assigned to each group. The activities are carefully planned so that each child receives maximum therapy. Most of the children have a great fear of water, and an important phase in the program is to get each one into a small pool. Then, as they gain confidence, they venture into the larger ones. Every activity is geared to learning, such as learning not to be afraid of the water, learning to sing, and to walk properly.
There is no known medical cure for brain damage in children. Drugs are used to help them function a little better. But the best medicine, as the camp director puts it, is an abundance of fresh air and an area where the children can play and run and feel free, up to a point, of course. Most important of all, however, is lots of TLC, tender, loving care. One of the most outstanding programs which has brought the Army and civilian communities closer together is Project Summertime, conducted at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Project Summertime was created in the fall of 1969 as a result of the domestic action program initiated by the President and congressional interest in providing summer youth camps at military installations. Coordinating with the mayors of the seven major cities within commuting distance, the commanding general of Fort Devens organized a council of advisors staffed by civilians and army personnel to establish a summer youth program. A budget was drawn up by the council and submitted to the senator instrumental in the birth of the project. Funding was obtained from several government agencies and foundations. Project Summertime is designed to accommodate 550 children each week for a period of nine weeks. Of this number, 180 boys between the ages of 12 and 16 camp overnight in barracks from Monday to Friday. The remaining 370 boys and girls, all between the ages of 9 and 16, commute daily for one week. In the summer of 1970, the U.S. Army played host to a little over 400,000 children. The commanding general of Fort Devens welcomes the children on arrival day. I wish to extend to each of you a very warm, sincere, and most hearty welcome to Fort Devens. Uh, we have been accorded the privilege and the opportunity of being the host to many hundreds of young people who will come to visit us this summer from nearby large cities. And this project has one main purpose, and that is to ensure that all of you have a rip-roaring good time while you're here at Fort Devens. We have outstanding facilities. We have outstanding counselors. But we need a third ingredient to make this a winning combination. And that third ingredient are enthusiastic, eager youngsters who want a good time, who cooperate and give and take. And when these buses rolled in a minute ago, that third ingredient arrived, and that's you. So all of us at Fort Devens want you to know that you're very welcome here, and all of us want to ensure that during the week that you're with us, you'll have a wonderful, enjoyable time. Good luck. Following his address, the general, who is vitally interested in the program, mingles with the children. It is doubtful if these kids have ever seen a general, let alone talked with one. Basketball, you going to shoot baskets while you're here? Good shoes up. In addition to the recreational activities and demonstrations the youngsters will enjoy, there are discussion periods concerning personal hygiene, cultural differences, drug addiction, and community involvement. First things first, and making up a bunk is one of the first things taught to the boys who will be billeted overnight. Each group has its own counselor who is from the same community. This makes for better communication during small group discussions. Same way. Make sure it's tucked in as tight as you can get it. Tuck it right in. Keeping more than 500 youngsters happy and contented every day is no simple task. However, good planning and preparation by the civilian camp directors and army personnel assigned to the project 
provide the children with a broad program of diversified and interesting activities. swimming hole is a swimming hole is a swimming hole. This one happens to be Mirror Lake in Fort Devens. To the parents of these youngsters who have not the means to send them to private camps, Project Summertime is a blessing. One look at their happy faces and you can tell these kids are having the time of their young lives. Lots of exercise and plenty of fresh air eventually brings on pangs of hunger. And by mealtime, the youngsters are ravenous. <laughs> Army food, prepared by Army cooks, served Army style. Except, of course, for the young food handlers. Each day, different boys volunteer to help serve the noon meal. Commendable. But rumor has it they also have the inside track to the ice cream and cake. There is more than enough to eat for everyone. And after five days of good, wholesome food like this, it's no wonder most of the children put on a bit of weight. Wherever there are kids, you find a soldier who is interested in their welfare. This kind of friendliness goes a long way in convincing today's youngster that maybe grown-ups aren't so bad after all. In addition to recreational activities, orientations and demonstrations are provided by some of the units stationed at Fort Devens. Here at the airfield, for instance, an orientation on the basic theory of flight. This morning I'd like to tell you something about our aircraft. This is a C-45 type aircraft. It's a command aircraft. It's designed to carry approximately four... Packs. In non-technical language, the characteristics and capabilities of an aircraft engine are explained, as well as the purpose and operation of a control tower. Receivers are located on the floor below you. The transmitters are located across the field, across the runway. We have our primary frequencies and our emergency frequencies that we monitor at all times. Who knows, but because of this brief introduction to aviation, one of these boys may someday be the pilot of a giant commercial airliner. Another demonstration the boys enjoy is one put on by the 18th Engineer Battalion. The presentation lasts two hours during which time the capabilities and functions of the more commonly used items of Army engineer equipment are explained. At the end of the period, the youngsters are permitted to examine the vehicles at close range. It is hoped that through such presentations, these young boys will benefit from experiences hitherto unavailable to them. The same applies to the girls, for whom a different type of program is arranged. What you're working for here is to overlap the bandage about halfway each time, with just a little bit of snugness, so that the blood is aided going back up from the leg to the heart. Continue up the leg until you get to the knee. How come the blood has to go back to the heart? Well, when the blood comes down from the heart to the leg, it comes by gravity because you're standing up. Now you need to have some way to help it get back up to the heart, particularly when you're lying down and you're not using your muscles to help move it back up to the heart. To become an army nurse, do you have to go to college or you don't have to go to college at all? No, you don't have to go to college, but there are different programs. Someday, perhaps because of this initial experience, one of these little girls may embark on a career in the healing arts. 
Highlighting the week's activities is a program conducted by a unit of the 10th Special Forces. Some of the boys show how brave they are by negotiating the rope bridge. At noon, the youngsters line up for their rations, just like regular troopers. Today's menu is sea rations, and the kids love it. You got steak there. This little fellow seems to be having a bit of trouble opening the can, but there's always a friendly soldier around to do the job. You've got cookies in there. Cookies and jam. One of the features of the day is a demonstration of precision parachute jumping. The youngsters are thrilled and delighted with the exhibition, and they don't hesitate to show it. The Special Forces program culminates with the make-believe parachute training jump from the Junior Mock Tower. Just like the real thing, the jump master hooks the trolley to the jumper's harness and away we go. Upon completion of his training jump, each boy receives a certificate of qualification as a junior parachutist. Because of close supervision and a well-planned schedule of recreation, orientations, and demonstrations, coupled with plenty of good food, fresh air, rest, and expert counseling, Project Summertime is a great success. We Americans, as a whole, too often think of our army solely as a violent instrument of national policy. This deduction is erroneous. For as you have just seen, the Army, in its other role, has performed and will continue to perform incalculable service toward the development of our nation and to the safety and well-being of our people. Yeah.